Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining in today's RTA webinar, The Ending of a Tenancy. My name is Lynn Smith. I'm a Senior Community Education Officer with the RTA. The RTA is presenting a series of educational webinars to help you understand Queensland tenancy laws. Today's session will run between 30 to 40 minutes, just depending on questions. So in today's session, we will be looking at how a tenancy can end, the responsibilities for tenants and property managers and owners, the vacate inspection, bond refunds, resolving disputes, tribunal applications, tenancy database, and also, as I said, for questions. If you'd like to expand your arrow on your screen, you will find a question box where you can submit questions through. And I'll try and attempt to um, answer as many as I can this half, um, at the end of the session. Before we do start though, I will launch a poll just to see who is in our audience today. So we're just asking which group in the rental sector do you belong to? So we're looking at whether you're a tenant or property manager or an owner, a landlord, community organisation or other. So I'll just leave that open for just a moment. If everyone could please click on the button um, appropriate to your answer. Great, I'll just close that. Thanks everybody for voting. And I'll just share the results there so that everyone can have a look in relation to the audience that we have today, where the majority of people uh, seem to be the property manager or the agent, um, followed by the landlord and then community support organisations and also we have other and tenant. Just for the property managers and the owners that have um, said that they're in today's session, if you could please also let us know how long you've been a property manager or an owner for in relation to your experience, just so that we can actually gauge the level of experience in today's session. I'll just leave that open for just a moment longer. Great, thanks everybody for voting for that. Okay, back to the webinar. So what we're looking at here is how a tenancy can end. And the Act outlines ways that the tenancy can end, and that is either a lessor or an agent can issue a notice to leave, and that can be with or without grounds. A tenant issues a notice of their intention to leave, mutually agreed, um, and we would recommend that this is in writing and signed by all parties. You can get a termination order from the tribunal. Uh, death of a sole tenant, mortgagee in possession, and this is a notice that's issued by the owner's bank. And then there's also abandonment. Remember all notices must be in writing and that there's timeframes do apply for issuing of the notices. The, responsibility, the Residential Tenancies and Roomy Accommodation Act 2008 outlines the rights and responsibilities for everyone involved in a tenancy. So no matter whether you're the landlord, agent or a tenant. So for some of the responsibilities for tenants at the end of the tenancy is to keep to the terms of the agreement, including any special terms. It's also going to be including paying rent, handing over the keys at the end of the tenancy, including any keys that may have been cut during the tenancy. Um, it's also to that one of the biggest responsibilities is outlined under section 188.4 and that is at the end of the tenancy the tenant must leave the premises and inclusions as far as possible in the same condition they were in at the start of the tenancy, fair wear and tear accepted. Also too, to remember that under section 205 when handing over possession the tenant must tell the lessor lessor's agent the tenant's new residential address unless the tenant has a reasonable excuse for not telling the address. And also too that the request must also be put in writing to the tenant. For responsibilities for property managers and owners, and again, keeping to, keeping to the terms of the tenancy agreement, but there's two other areas here that are important to remember. And that's section 96, rent payment must not be applied for any other purpose. And so as an example, if a tenant has overpaid rent 
um, not keeping that and um, using it towards water or cleaning costs or anything like that, rent is rent. And so if a tenant has overpaid, then that needs to be refunded back. Leading up to the property being vacant, the property manager or owner may need to be showing um, prospective tenants through in order to relet the property. The legislation allows this to occur, but providing the required notice and the rules of entry are followed. So the rules are outlined under section 192 to 199 of the Act. Also to section 204 of the legislation outlines the property manager or owner must not conduct an open house or allow an open house to be conducted without the tenant's written consent. So leading up to the property being relet, good communication between the manager or the owner and the tenant is recommended to discuss what promotion and access may be required, clarify any expectations and deal with any potential issues to avoid a dispute occurring. Further note too that the um, section 203 is the lessor or lessor's agent must not use photos or image of showing tenants' possessions in advertising. So just to flag that the unlawful entry um, or unlawful entering the property, um, conducting an open house or using photos without tenant's permission has got um, um, penalty provisions under our legislation. So the vacate inspection, so remember the tenant is to return the property in the same condition it was at the start of the tenancy less fair wear and tear. And quite often we do hear tenants will say they've left it in better condition than what it was at the start of the tenancy or that the owner is um, trying to claim for something that was there when they moved in. So what really resolves this is really good documentation and good evidence. So a fully completed entry condition report, photos, receipts or other evidence to show what that condition of the property was like at the start of the tenancy. And if you refer to our previous webinar about the start of a tenancy, there's information in relation to that entry condition report process. So at the end of the tenancy, the tenant is to complete the exit condition report as outlined under section 66 of the Act. They should be providing a copy of the report as soon as practical after the agreement ends to the owner or the manager who then has three business days. It's the only part of the Act that actually mentions business days um, in our Act is this particular section. And then the owner or manager completes the report and then they return to the tenant's address. It's recommended to ensure that the report's completed thoroughly and time is taken to ensure all areas inside and out of the property are covered. So the RTA recommends both the tenant and the property manager owner take photos at the end as well as further evidence for the property condition. And also to the exit reports compared to the entry condition report which was completed at the start. And again, those photos are a great, great way to attach to both the entry and the exit reports. The RTA has a video on our website regarding how to complete the entry condition report. And again, as I said before, we have covered this particular topic in a previous webinar. So an option is also to consider doing the vacate inspection together. So while this is not a requirement, it may also be an opportunity to address any issues quickly um, and to avoid anything escalating to a dispute. So I just asked one of the questions coming through is, is a tenant, um, is there an obligation for the agent to complete the exit report? And while obviously the obligation is there for the tenant to complete the exit condition report, um, I would think it's probably a best practice that the agent or the manager or owner does complete one, particularly if there's any issues in relation to the condition of the property. So the problem at the end, so what if there's problems? So what happens if there's cleaning or mowing or damage or rent that's owed? So again, the legislation does not state that the tenant has to be given the opportunity to rectify any issues. It just states that the tenant returns the property in the same condition, less fair wear and tear, and that's it. So having said that, there used to be a code of conduct under the previous real estate agent legislation requiring a tenant to be given an opportunity to go back and rectify the item. So while this is no longer, there seems to be a level of expectation in the sector and also with some adjudicators that at the end of the tenancy, there is communication that occurs between both the tenant and the owner or manager and that they are aware of any issues and what steps are going to be taken to rectify it. So you need to be working out who, what and when and how the item is going to be rectified. In some instances, some managers or owners may choose to give tenants 
a time to go back and rectify the item. Again, it doesn't state in our legislation that. And some of that time frame may be 24 hours, some people give less, some people give more. So it's on a case by case basis, depending on obviously the reletting situation and the availability. Some of the other options may include that the tenant or the manager or owner is engaging a tradesperson direct, or it may be that the payment is given to the manager or the owner, or that the money is taken from the bond. Again, we really are encouraging communication to resolve a lot of these issues. The RTA is advising too, there's a responsibility for both the tenant and the property manager or the owner to resolve any of the property condition concerns and communicate with each other respectfully, often, and also too with the intention to resolve the matter, not escalate it. So one of the biggest questions we're always asked is what is fair wear and tear and what's deemed to be damaged? So in relation to what we have, fair wear and tear generally means the wear or damage that naturally occurs through normal, ordinary, everyday use. So what you need to be looking to consider is the day-to-day -day living, the exposure to the elements, time, and also ageing of the premises or inclusions. So as an example, scuff marks on walls or floors, the carpet pile flattened by furniture, excuse me, or foot traffic, um, it could also be that the curtains or the blinds are deteriorated or become brittle after years of exposure to the sunlight. So what may be signs of damage may be holes in walls and it may also be like large stains or um, damage to the carpet. Keep in mind new properties will not be kept in new condition and after a time there will be signs that wear and tear. So other questions we are asked is what is a depreciation time on items? Um, and that is beyond the RTA's role and we would refer you to the Australian Taxation Office or a depreciation expert. But clearly paint, carpets and items in a rental property have a depreciation cycle and that may need to be taken into account, particularly if you're looking to replace it or rectify it due to damage or claiming compensation. So the quickest and easiest way to get a refund of the rental bond from the RTA is to have an agreed refund between the manager and owner and all the tenants. So if either party cannot agree, then either the tenant or the manager or the owner can submit a refund to the RTA. This is going to start what we call a notice of claim process. So it's really important that both the tenant and the manager and the owners communicate at the end of the tenancy and organise the handover, the vacate inspection and an agreed refund form, whether there's a claim or no claim on the bond. If the um, manager or the owner is claiming on the rental bond, they should only ever claim the amount that they're entitled to claim. So as an example, if, we, if the RTA is holding $2,000 bond, and there's money owed, say, for example, for cleaning and maybe a week's rent. Um, and say, example would be that it may be around 650 as the claim, or it may actually be 700. I only ever claim an estimate of what you need. So if you're not sure you haven't got an invoice from the cleaner, you may just add a little bit more to look at claiming the estimate. Don't claim the whole amount if you are not entitled to claim the whole amount. Release the balance to the tenant. The RTA is only going to refund into Australian bank accounts, so it's really important the RTA has the correct bank accounts. So double check the information you provide to us, making sure that you've got the right BSB and also the account details. And just on the last point up here is about the false and misleading claims may constitute an offence under the Residential Tenancies and Remy Accommodation Act. So again, this is where I go back and so let's say, making sure for agents and owners, only ever claim on the bond what you're entitled to claim. If you are not looking for the whole bond, but an estimated amount, or you have invoices or rent that's owed, only be claiming those amounts, not claiming the whole bond if you're not entitled to the whole bond. So with the notice of claim process, so if the tenant or the manager or the owner has sent a refund form to the RTA without the other person's signature or agreement, this is the, um, on how the bond is to be paid out, sorry, we will inform the other person if they wish to dispute the claim. So this process is called the notice of claim and this is a legislative time frame of 14 days for the other person whose signature is missing for them to respond to. So if the person 
disagrees, they will then complete a dispute resolution request form, send it to the RTA before the notice expiry date. Um, or they can agree to the notice and inform the RTA, or if no response received, then we will pay out as and disperse the bond as directed on that refund form. So again, it's really important to make sure the RTA has up-to-date details, address, email and phone number. So for agents and managers in, in today's session and agency principals, it's really important if your staff changes that you inform the RTA who in your office has active authority, what names to be removed or added. So it's really, again, really important for the agents and managers to make sure that the RTA has accurate records our end, who has the authorities and who does not. So with dispute resolution, the RTA sees this as a three-step process. First step is self-resolution. Second step, if it's not resolved, then parties can access the RTA's free dispute resolution service for assistance. And then if it's not resolved and, stay, and stays unresolved, then you can proceed to QCAT. Just before we um, continue through, I'm just going to launch another poll. Bear with me. So in this question, we're asking, what is the biggest concern for you at the end of the tenancy? If everybody could please answer that, that would be great. So we're looking at either the vacate inspection, the bond refund, entry for inspections, um, no real problems, most tenancy runs smoothly or other. So I'll just leave everyone for a moment just to complete that. So one of the questions that's come through is what happens if a landlord does not submit the bond to the RTA? What rights does the tenant and the landlord have? Um, okay, for a start, just to answer that one, and again, was covered in our um, start of a tenancy webinar, but it is an offence not to lodge a bond with the RTA. Um, and there's penalty provisions that's attached to that. So if we don't have a bond, then um, the tenant can actually do a um, fill in an investigation complaint form with the RTA. And as I said, there's penalty provisions attached in relation to a bond not being held at the RTA if bond has been paid. So our investigation area can look into it. Um, if it's the end of the tenancy and the tenant's looking for the bond money to be returned, they also then not only just do an um, investigation kit to the RTA, but they can also do a dispute request through our dispute resolution process to actually get that money and maybe potentially pursue it to QCAT. Okay, I'll just close that poll. Thank you everybody for voting. Okay, so it looks like um, a lot of people saying that the biggest issue is in relation to the vacate inspection. Okay. So what types of disputes does the RTA receive? There's three main types. So we have bond claims. So this is where someone has disputed a claim. Over half of the disputes that the RTA receives are bond related matters. We also have tenancy matters, and this is usually during a tenancy. So when there is issues on potential like entry, water, repairs and maintenance not being done, rent arrears, and then we also have compensation above the bond amount. So if the bond's been paid out and there's an opportunity to pursue to QCAT for the um, money if it's over and above the bond amount, you need a notice of unresolved dispute from the RTA to pursue that. The RTA recommends self-resolution in the first instance. So we really are encouraging both sides to actually be communicating with each other, sharing information, the knowledge um, of legislation, evidence, photographs, ask questions, focusing on the facts, not um, being emotional, what options are available, is there a level of negotiation, and also to empathy and respect goes a long way in trying to resolve a lot of these issues. To start the dispute resolution process, a client needs to complete a dispute resolution request form and submit it to the RTA, along with the relevant supporting documents. And this is really important to understand. The RTA doesn't need all tenancy documentation in relation to the situation. They may need like a breakdown of the claim on the bond, any sort of invoices or information that actually helps the conciliation process 
about what's actually involved with the dispute. So if the, uh, and keep in mind the RTA also too, last financial year, we received over 29,000 disputes across Queensland. So the RTA follows what we call an intake and case assessment methodology as part of the conciliation process. So an intake officer will assess the file as to the suitability to proceed to a telephone conference. So one of the main factors in assessment is the willingness for parties to participate in the conciliation process. As our process is a voluntary one, we cannot force parties to participate with us, but we will heavily encourage it. And the RTA resolves over three quarters of the disputes we receive where parties participate in our process. As part of the assessment, we also look at the complexity and type of issues, the availability of the parties and the level of, level of conflict. So the RTA also publishes matters unsuitable for conciliation and that's available on the RTA's website. So and if the matter is unsuitable, then what we do is issue a notice of unresolved dispute and parties then can pursue it to, directly to the tribunal. If, it's, um, if it is suitable, it then progresses to the telephone conferencing process. So the conciliation process is done by way of telephone conferencing where we have the tenant and the manager or the owner and the conciliator on the phone at the same time. So on occasion, it may be conducted by a way of what we call shuttle negotiation, which is separate calls between the parties. So it's really important to note that if English is not your first language or that um, for one of the clients in participating in the process, then a translator and a translator is required, then the RTA will organise one to help out. So in some instances too, people with maybe like a disability or the elderly may also nominate a support person or give someone authority to act on their behalf. So parties to the dispute own the dispute. So conciliator is impartial, they're not there to take sides or make decisions, but to provide a safe environment for parties to have their say and will encourage both sides to reach an agreement and help participants um, to consider all the possible options based on Queensland tenancy law. The process is a confidential one, so anything that's said in this process is inadmissible should it proceed to the tribunal. So for agents and managers, it's really important that you ascertain first whether you need to be talking to your landlord client prior um, to the telephone conferencing or to the dispute and whether you have the authority to negotiate on their behalf prior to participating in the process. So that's really important um, that um, you do that. So if the matter is resolved, the conciliator is going to put it in writing, get everyone to sign what the result is, um, or it might be that they sign a refund form if it's bond related. So if the matter is unresolved, as I said before, a notice of unresolved disputes issued and the person who lodged the dispute request form will be issued with that notice to pursue it directly to the tribunal. So the tribunal is the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, QCAT, and applications and processes about QCAT can be found on their website. So there's also a checklist, application, the fees applicable and where to lodge. You need to be lodging your application in the um, tribunal closest to the rental property. The legislation outlines two applications, there's urgent and non-urgent. So with the non-urgent application, that requires a notice of unresolved dispute from the RTA. So that's your bond disputes, compensation or monetary sort of type of disputes. And keep in mind there is a time frame that applies to lodging, which I'll talk about that shortly. Um, in relation to urgent applications, the word urgent doesn't mean the application is fast-tracked or that the matter depends on your urgency to deal with. An urgent application is outlined under the legislation under section 415 and all other matters are non-urgent. So urgent applications may be failure to leave, excessive hardship, repeated breaches or abandonment. So I just want to touch on bond disputes. So for bond disputes, it is important to remember that this is very time sensitive. So once the notice of unresolved disputes issued, the person has a seven day time frame to lodge an application with the tribunal and also to notify the RTA in writing of the application receipt details. As I said, it's a two part process. If both processes are not followed and the RTA is not notified by the applicant by the due time, then the bond will be paid out. So if you're the person to lodge, don't leave this to the last minute. Get your paperwork, your evidence and start preparing your application as soon as that notice is issued by the conciliator. So for tenancy matters, um, just to keep in mind, it's important to remember that 
The time frame to pursue through the tribunal is six months. So that's from when you're aware of the event or the breach. And for information on the conciliation process, the RTA's dispute resolution service, there is a um, information on the RTA's website, just search dispute and there's also a flow chart that you can also follow as well and some hints and tips. So now as a tip for preparing for the conciliation, make sure that you allow time for the call, think about the issues and write them down, consider the ways that you want the matter resolved and the outcome you, you would be willing to accept and have all your documentation ready as well. As I said, there's a flowchart on our dispute process on our website. And just remember too, we cannot deal with disputes between managers and owners, nor can we deal with um, disputes between co-tenants. So, and also that the RTA does not deal with um, neighbourhood disputes either. So just touching on too, we've often been asked, well, what happens when the tenant does not vacate? So if the manager of the owner has issued a notice to leave in accordance with the legislation requirements and the time frame has been met and the tenant has not vacated by the expiry of the notice, then you can apply for an urgent application to QCAT for a termination order and a warrant of possession. It's an urgent application, so you go directly to QCAT. Note that this does not apply for rooming accommodation. So if for, an, um, sorry, for a warrant of possession, if it's been granted, then a copy is going to be sent to your local police station to action it within a time frame as outlined by the courts. And if you're not familiar with the process, I would then recommend contacting QCAT and also too, you may want to liaise with your local police station after the hearing as well. The tribunal self-representation. So there's no solicitors, barristers, you represent yourself. And the timeframes for the hearing will vary depending on your location. So again, best to check with your local tribunal. So whether your application is urgent or non-urgent, you need to make sure that you take all your paperwork and evidence in relation to the tenancy. So people often ask, what do I take? And I would probably respond and say, usually everything. So don't, you don't get a second chance to rely on something that you didn't bring on the day. So you need your tenancy paperwork, your written correspondence, record of any conversations, photographs and a chronological summary of key issues. And what we mean by that is some of the key dates and times of when notices might have been issued um, and just have a date reference in relation to that or when there might have been rent arrears and so forth. It really will actually help the adjudicators on the day as well. So in relation to tenancy databases, and I'm just a bit conscious of our time here because we have a lot of questions. We've had over 500 people register for today's session. So we are, have got a lot of questions coming through. So I'm hoping to get to a, quite a few of those. There seem to be quite a few themes coming through as well. So the legislation for tenancy databases is outlined in relation to when and how someone can actually be put on a tenancy database. So again, main thing is that the database, um, had, that the tenancy has ended that the person's named on the agreement, that there's a reason as listed under the Act, that the personal information or um, has been given or reasonable steps have been taken to disclose that information, the person has had 14 days to review that information and also to make sure that any submissions made about the information has been considered. This is all outlined in our legislation. So with the tenancy databases, we know that these give, data, give owners a way of protecting their investment. However, unfair listings have occurred in the past. So the Act provides protection against inaccurate, um, incomplete, ambiguous or out of date listings. And just remember too, a listing can only be on a database for only three years. With the additional um, provisions that came through as part of the Plumbing and Drainage and Other Legislation Amendment Act in 2016, there's also rules in relation to the use of databases before the commencement of a tenancy and checking that tenancy history. So again, this is also outlined in our legislation. Um, and just to give you some background about tenancy databases, so Queensland was the first jurisdiction in Australia to regulate tenancy database laws. Um, that was back in uh, 2003. So in current times, all the states and territories now follow the same provisions as part of a national uniform approach. So again, keep in mind there's penalty provisions uh, for not following these rules. Just finally in relation to keeping records, just a reminder, property managers and owners are required to keep records relating to a tenancy for one year after the tenancy is ended. That relates to your entry and exit reports, your tenancy agreement and your rent payment records. 
So it's also recommended to maybe just keeping a copy of any written correspondence that may have been relating to that tenancy. So again, really important to keep those records. And just a quick update from the RTA. Um, we're currently developing an online bond refund service. So feedback that we've received during this consultation process um, will actually inform the development of the product. So that's actually occurring now. So the RTA is committed to providing customers with a more flexible, convenient and efficient way to transact with us. And this also in, in, follows on from the successful launch of the bond lodgement service in June this year as well. So we're also working on a gateway to help agents lodge multiple bonds. So that will also is in the pipeline as well. So as with the online bond lodgement, the RTA will ensure that we do have paper-based refund forms that will remain available for customers who don't access the RTA's web services. So as we progress through the project, the RTA is going to keep you everybody informed in the sector through various channels and one of those will actually be through the RTA news articles. So just in summary, um, understanding your rights and responsibilities um, and the tenancy in accordance with the Act, ensure that notices have been issued with the correct time frame and also to make sure that you are keeping copies of any notices that you have issued as well and that's really important to remember that. Thorough exit condition report and photos recording the property condition and I know we've got a lot of questions have come through in relation to the tenant um, not completing the exit condition report and as I said before it's probably still a best business practice that you still complete the exit report and still have evidence in relation to what the property condition is like, particularly if there's going to be a um, dispute over what that property condition is. So communicate leading up to and after the vacate inspection, both the tenant and the manager and the owner, so both parties have responsibilities to ensure of that good communication. And remember the quickest way to get a bond refund is whether there's a claim on it or no claim, is an agreed refund bond submitted to the RTA and signed by everybody. All right, we're just going to get to the questions just before I um, finish up. And we do have a lot of questions that's come through um, in relation to the ending of the tenancy, the condition reports and things like that. Um, there's also some questions that's been submitted through that's actually out outside this type of topic, um, but that's great because that sort of information helps us um, put together information for future webinars as well. So there's a lot of questions coming through about fair wear and tear, um, and I think I've addressed a lot of those in relation to um, what we have actually said in the presentation. Um, one of the big questions that's coming through in relation to does the tenant have to be given the opportunity to fix up any cleaning at the end of the tenancy and again I go back to the legislation where we talk about um, the one, section 188 for tenant returns to property same condition less fair wear and tear. Um, there's no actual part of our legislation to say give that but there is expectations in the sector in relation to um, get, talking to the tenant in relation to what needs to happen, who's going to rectify it and so forth. Um, questions in relation to that also say how much time do I have to give? Well again that's up to an individual. As I said we have seen practices range from 24 hours to rectify things. Some people um, are saying less, some people are saying more. So again that's not um, a legislative time frame. A copy of the presentation um, and our webinar will be available on our RTA website um, over the coming weeks. So again, if you're looking for more information or going back to clarify anything, um, please make sure that you um, follow that through. Um, can a tenant lodge a refund form before the lease is up and before they have vacated? Um, well, no, the actual, um, on the refund form, we actually ask those questions in relation to what is the date that the tenancy ends or what is the handover. So realistically there shouldn't be a claim on the bond until that has actually happened. So what happens if I need to claim for repairs and I don't have the invoices? And again this is where I come back to saying make sure that you don't claim the bond um, if you don't need the whole bond um, and this is really important that you might have an estimate in relation from your tradespeople about what it may be um, but again only be claiming what you're entitled to be claiming. Um, 
Someone's asking where can I access the tenant databases? So these are actually privately run database companies and where they require like membership or anything like that. So again, I refer you to probably talking to your local um, sector representation um, organisations such as for real estate agents might be the REIQ, for property owners would be the um, Property Owners Association and for tenants to be talking to Tenants Queensland. So what happens if there's no entry condition report or photos at the start and there's damage at the end? And I think that's a fairly valid question. A few people have asked about not having the entry condition report at the start. Um, and that's really important to say that, well, realistically, you need some sort of evidence to prove what that condition of the property is like at the start of the tenancy. Um, and it may be that there might be some other documentation or some entry condition, um, some uh, routine inspections that might have occurred during the tenancy. But if you've taken over a rent roll or you're taking over a management and there's no paperwork, we would recommend to make sure that you get in and try and rectify that situation and go and talk to the tenant, ask whether they have a copy of a report um, or going through and making sure that you actually do one just to rectify your paperwork so that at least then you have a starting point moving forward with a lot of those. And it also comes to with a lot of the transfer, there's some questions about the transferring of bonds in relation to um, from one rent roll to another. And again, just making sure that the RTA has the list and the appropriate list and also to the people who have the authority to actually be doing those transfers. One of the questions is, is carpet cleaning compulsory? Um, it's not compulsory as such. Again, we're talking about the condition of the property at the start of the tenancy. Um, and that is in relation to if the carpets were steam cleaned at the start, then the tenant has a responsibility to steam clean at the end of the tenancy as well. So again, we're talking about that property condition and the tenant is to return the property same condition less fair wear and tear. Um, when someone's asking to when the online refund form is available, um, as I said, at the moment that's actually in development. Um, so once we actually, we'll be doing a very similar process to what we do with our lodgement process and that is that uh, once we actually have a prototype, we will then actually be going out and doing some testing in relation to the sector, uh, testing with the sector in relation to what the product is. So watch this space, that is actually on the cars and will be coming and will be available soon. So what do you do if a tenant refuses you to um, access to the property to relet it? Again, this comes down to the, again that really good communication. If someone, if you've if you've issued the notices in accordance to the legislation um, and the timeframes, and you've met that, then you are entitled to enter. However, if you do get to the property and a tenant is saying you cannot enter, and they've got a reasonable grounds it and said, I have spoken about this before in relation. It might be that they've got a family member sick, or it might be that they've just come off shift work or something like that then what we need to do, what you need to do is obviously maybe try and renegotiate another date or time. Or if you have someone that is blanketly refusing you to have access and refuses to negotiate another date or time, again, you have access to the RTA's free dispute resolution service. Um, and you can come through our service to try and get some assistance in that regard. So we have some more questions in relation to the water bills at the end of the tenancy. And although I haven't probably touched on water as a, probably as a whole topic, it's really important to understand that um, the Act actually outlines um, that the tenant has one month to pay any water accounts. And it's really also important to um, note too that not to store up water bills till the very end of the tenancy. You should actually be issuing those water accounts as they come through and be communicating with the tenant in relation to the payment of those. There has been cases at the tribunal in relation to um, owners and agents not being awarded water bills because they've stored them up and, and ha had them all at the end or they've had like 12 months worth of water bills where those water bills could have been issued quarterly. So there has been some tribunal um, outcomes in relation to that. So again, um, you need to be communicating with the tenant. Tenant has one month to pay for those water bills. Um, and again, keeping those bills sent regularly to the tenants. Um, I think we're sort of, I think we're sort of very close to actual time here. I know that there's some more questions that's um, come through 
in relation to more about the vacate inspection and also to the entry and the exit reports. So again, for the entry condition report, we do have a video on our website in relation to how to complete that. Um, and also too, we recommend tenants having a look at that as well because that actually encourages them to actually complete it and do their part at the start. And also to reminds them about the responsibility at the end of the tenancy as well. So I think we'll, it's now um, time to end of the webinar, but before we do end, again, thank you very much. There's been a lot of questions come through, but a lot of the themes are very similar in relation to um, the bonds and the vacates inspections and things like that. So thank you everybody for um, attending today's seminar. Um, at, once I close the seminar, the um, survey will pop up on your screen. So please stay logged on to do the survey. This is a great opportunity for you to provide the RTA with feedback on the types of topics that you wanna know more about. And that's really important to the RTA. This actually helps us gauge in relation to future webinar topics. Um, so again, please take the time to actually complete that. Again, thank you for your time in attending today's session. I know that we've just slightly run over. Um, it's been my pleasure to speak with you today. And again, please take those few minutes to complete the post-webinar survey. Thank you.